Good morning, everybody. Again. <laughs> Today's scripture comes from the book of John. So if you are at home and you have your Bibles, I ask for you to turn to John chapter 13. If you have your phone or it's on an app, we'll give you a moment so that you can open that up. It is John chapter 13, and we will be looking at verses 1 through 17 this morning. And for those of you who are, um, who are thinking, what, you know, what exactly a story is this? This story is in reference to when Christ washed the feet of his disciples um, as they were in the middle of their last meal together. And so I will begin to read this, this section of the scripture, John 13, starting with verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Segariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon, Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew he was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a master greater than the one, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Here ends the reading of the scripture for today. Amen. So today in this message of a heart of service, of bending low and reading this scripture in this story of how Christ washed his disciples' feet, there's three things that stand out. The actions or inactions of the disciples, the actions of Christ, and as well, the actions that Christ is calling us into this time and space to perform. So let us just bow our heads right now as we just offer up in a pause before we begin this message. Dear gracious, loving God, just thank you for today. Thank you for each and every member who is, who is viewing this in their homes, on their tablets, on their devices, who is listening into this message. As this message, take it and pour in to each and every one of us so that we can go forth and perpetuate your kingdom here on earth as Christ has shown and demonstrated for us. We do all this in his glorious name. Amen. So the actions of the disciples. I don't know about you, but every time I read this scripture, I always have to come back and ask myself, why didn't one of them already have their feet washed? Like, they came to the table without washing their feet. It's like 
when I was a kid and all of us kids got called to the table and the parents or the adult at the table took that extra long pause before they started grace and it was awkward and everyone was looking around and salivating over their food until somebody mentions did you wash your hands to which there is a scurry and everybody goes off to whichever available sink is open to wash their hands to quickly come back to the table but that was not the case for the disciples now typical travelers during this time frame basically their shoes were just that sandals a sole some straps some cloth wrapping it together and holding it onto their foot and onto their lower leg so therefore their foot was exposed if anybody has worn flip-flops on a dirty dirt road I should say or at the beach you really get it the sand and the particles can just get in everywhere and during this time it was no exception I mean the roads for a century I mean they were dusty they were muddy they, especially if it rained and never mind the extra added surprises that the animals left you know the little mounds along the way yep even those were present and even those people stepped in them it was messy traveling but here the disciples were they were here at a Passover meal a holy meal and they had all come to the table with dirty feet now remember the story that they had rented this upper room so in renting it there was no servant to greet them at the door to take care of this need to fulfill this custom it's almost like all of us I think of during our quarantine time when we all came out and everyone posted pictures about how their hair was down to here and loved ones had to take up the scissors and shears and bathrooms everywhere I remember recently when a group of um, adults in the family got together and my son came over and as we were all talking he looked at down at one in particular person's feet I will not name names to protect the innocent here and simply said to them wow you need some professional help with that you really need to go get a pedicure now that we are out of quarantine so you can only imagine what the feet looked like from the disciples at the time and we know that there was a basin there was a basin there was a pitcher of water right there for Christ to use right there for anybody to use they he didn't need to perform a miracle he didn't need for ask anybody to bring them to him they were there the question still remains why didn't even one of the disciples wash those smelly dirty mud cake dungan smelling feet before they sat down for a meal in Luke's version of the Last Supper we kind of gain a little bit of clarity some understanding if you go back and look at Luke 22 verses 24 it says alas a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest ha. there it is there is an argument going on a rather I'm thinking robust lively dinner debate and conversation at the Last Supper if the disciples were trying to make a case for themselves each of them then over who was the greatest among them surely surely in their humanness the lowliest of lowliest of servant jobs was not on their mind in fact I am pretty sure that they were probably thinking of a hundred other reasons why someone else at the table should be washing their own feet see for the disciples not making a choice is making a choice that was the disciples actions not making one the greatest deterrent to being a humble servant is an apathy I don't care for or laziness I don't want to do it it's pride I shouldn't have to certain tasks are beneath me I'd rather do something else and I don't want to do that that's the attitude of a prideful person let somebody else take care of it not me when we see something that needs to be done what's our attitude what's in our own hearts my children kind of demonstrate this same action in regards to the disciples mindset as well 
It comes to when I ask somebody to get something out of the dryer, you know, the dryer in the basement, through the unfinished section of the basement, through the utility room. It's normally held in kind of like that dark little area back there. And even though it is perfectly fine and capable for me to go and get and do the laundry out of the dryer, when I tend to ask somebody else in the household, it's interesting how it gets passed down to one person to the next. Can you do this for me if I do that for you? Yet, there was a no. There was a clear, resounding no that did come up from Simon Peter. He actually had an issue with Christ washing his feet. And I believe Peter had some understanding that something wasn't right. Something was a little off. But he quite couldn't put his finger on it. Perhaps Peter was speaking out of some inner con conviction. Maybe because if you have gone through scripture, Peter is kind of known for doing this. And maybe he was eventually catching on at this last moment and opportunity. Nonetheless, we see him refusing Christ, refusing him outright. And this isn't the first time. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus, when he was explaining to the disciples, when he was explaining to them about his upcoming, upcoming death and suffering in crucifixion, it was Peter who declared, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And what did Christ do at that time? He rebuked him then. He rebuked Peter way back then, and he reminded him that he was only, he was not thinking of God. He was thinking of manly things. You see, it sounded like Peter didn't want to see our Lord suffer and die, but Christ still rebukes him and claimed at that time that he was being selfish. See, we can understand Peter, who loved his teacher and Lord, didn't want to have the image of, of Christ as this earthly warrior king being ruined for him. The news caused Peter to wonder, what's, going, what's this going to mean for me? You see, if Peter didn't argue with Christ, he was always the first one to offer resistance. And he did so then. This is action that action of resistance. So those were the things that the disciples offered up, their actions and their inactions at their time. But it's also interesting to see what Christ did, Christ's own actions during this last supper and time with his disciples. And he showed us in so many ways, especially in this illustration, especially in this demonstration, just how selfless, of a leader he was, of how a servant leader is to respond. Now, picture the scene. This is something that I do personally myself, especially when I am having a difficult time processing a situation, when something is weighing heavily on my heart. Those times of such sorrow and deep, deep despair. I always stop and look and think of others' perspectives. How does someone else looking in on the situation, how is someone else in the situation perceiving this matter? And above all else, how is God himself looking down? How is Christ seeing my actions being portrayed? And so I offer us this opportunity to do just that here and now, to stop and really consider, to stop and look at the room not through the disciples' eyes, not from a bird's eyes view who is being told the story, but from Christ's perspective himself. Here you are, sitting at a table, with the disciples arguing amongst themselves over who will be the greatest. And then you slowly gets up. He gets up and he strips off his own clothing. And he readies himself as a servant. Now, maybe by now, you would think, as someone's taking off their clothes, the disciples might have noticed his actions. Too busy arguing before, they all of a sudden might have started to quiet their voices. And as Christ goes and stoops down low, as he takes a basin in water and starts to pour it and clean it over the first disciples' feet, 
the room, the chaotic noise, the bickering, stilling itself into stunned silence. Here they were, all arguing about who was the greatest among them. But yet they all, all had the same dirty feet. There was an obvious need among them, and not one of them had rose to the occasion to take care of it except for our Christ and Savior. And it was even more significant that he chose. He chose to do it during the meal. The meal was in progress. So as Christ is sitting there watching this lively conversation, if you've ever been at a, a table with a group of friends or with a large family members at Thanksgiving, and it's a lively discussion and conversation going on, he waited until that moment, until that very aspect. Why? So that not one of them could say, oh, yeah, no, I was just about ready to go do that. Hold on one second. You know that cry that often comes from children when they're trying to tell us, oh, no, yeah, yeah, that's right. I've got to go make my bed before I can have breakfast. Right on it. And off they go. The time, the meal was at hand. The time for washing had come and gone. Now consider this. Lovingly, that Jesus, in his final hours, before he was to be tortured, before he was to be crucified, before he was forsaken by those very twelve that were sitting before him, he stopped and ministered. Now, believe, believe me, if it was I in that situation, I think I would be looking for someone to minister onto me. But instead, that is not what Christ does. That is not what a selfless servant does for those that he cares for. Serving others. He wasn't focused on his own problems. He wasn't focused on having his own needs met at the time. He was focused on meeting their needs right where they were then and now in that time and space. I can't help you. I've got my own problems. Aren't those things that we as humans and our humanness often say? I don't got time. I'm not the one. But Christ here gives us a, a demonstration, an example. He could have demanded any one of them to wash his feet, but he didn't. He was selfless. In what ways can we ourselves be selfless and humble servants? For Christ truly was a servant leader. You look at the scripture, even in that verse 12 and in 13, where he, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Every good leader also knows that there is a need for them to be a good servant. There are people in some leadership positions who simply abuse their title, are focused on the power of the position, and what they themselves can gain. A good leader won't ask somebody to do what they themselves are unwilling to do themselves. A good leader is willing to step beneath his position and perform the most menial of tasks. I remember on my first time coming back to Faith Community Church, Faith Community Church is my, my home church when I was younger, moved away, and then as we were transitioning to come back, I had set up a, a meeting to come and speak with Pastor Stan. And I had texted. I knew he was here in the church building, and upon entry into his office, he was nowhere to be found, and I quite couldn't figure out where he was. Until he turned the corner and said, hold on, there's a problem, I'll be right back, as he had a plunger in his hand. He was going off to take care of a toilet that needed to be fixed something that surely a call could have been made, somebody else could have been brought in, but a demonstration nonetheless of a servant leader. Uh, the late Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, yes, I will self-claim, that my children love Wendy's. It's their favorite place, so we do frequent it occasionally. But Dave Thomas always says the key to his success was that he had an MBA. It wasn't a certificate on the wall. It was his mop and bucket attitude. 
his willingness to do whatever task needed to be done, whatever job needed to be taken care of at any one of his establishments and restaurants, he would do it. A servant leader leads regardless of how they might look. They understand the importance of aiming high is by bending low. And Jesus even washed the feet of Judas. Now just imagine this scene of, of Jesus kneeling down and staring, staring at this dingy, smelly feet of Judas. Imagine as he's washing his feet that he looks and peers directly into Judas's eyes, looks deep within the soul of the one who will soon betray him. And so lovingly and so tenderly, at that moment, cleans his feet. He knew this. He knew what Judas was, was planning to do, what he had done, what he would put into motion, but he cleaned his feet anyways. He washed the very feet of his enemy. And if you know our Savior on a personal level, then you're aware that he did it, and he wasn't had any bit of remorse about it. We are called to serve even those who don't love us, even those who have hatred for us. I remember Martin Luther King. If you go back, there was a poll that was done during his time of, in 1966. Two-thirds, just stop and think about that, two-thirds of the American population at the time had an unfavorable opinion of him. Unfavorable. And that was a 26% increase from 1963. Two-thirds of the American population. Today, during his birthday and celebration, you will find people quoting his words. But while he lived, he served a country, a nation, that did not like him. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 46, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? To put it another way, if you serve only those who serve you, what credit is that to yourself? That is exactly what non-Christians do. I need you to go beyond. I need you to dig deeper. I need you to go higher. If we're going to aim high and be like Christ, then we need to bend low. Our actions in this time and space matter. The scripture and what Christ was calling and saying then applies and is so relevant to right here and now. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, state this and remind us of this fact. There is even a quote that is said by a Warren Wisby who says, Jesus spoke about taking up a cross, but all they were interested in was taking up a crown, referring to the disciples at this time. It's not easy to make ourselves available for service. I know on a personal level, it's not easy. And Christ is going to test us. He's going to call us at the most inconvenient times. If you have children or if you have loved ones who have reached out to you at 2.30 in the morning when you're in the middle of a really great deep sleep, wonderful dreams, you know. My son even talked about it the other day. He said, Mom, I was so amazed the other night. And I said, really, why? What happened? He said, well, I came into your room, and I was coming in real quietly because I know that you were really tired and you were trying to get a good night's sleep. And I crept up on the side of your bed, and, and you were laying there. And all you did was just open your eyes and say, yes, Nigel, can I help you? And then you just got right up and helped me. I was amazed. And I turned to him, and I said, well, what was so amazing about that? He's like, well, you didn't even jump up. I couldn't even scare you. And um, you weren't even upset with me at all about it. 
Trust me, there's going to be inconvenient times. Times when we'd be rather doing something else, like sleeping. Times when we have other commitments. Times when we have other plans on our agenda. Now, there are definitely times, of course, when it's right to say no to other people's requests. But remember who our Lord and Savior is. Being willing to say yes when we feel like saying no is a true mark of selflessness. It is a true mark. As we Christians go through life, are we looking for how we can minister to others, or are we only focused on how others can minister to us? Are we focused on looking for opportunities to serve? Are we willing to allow God to interrupt our lives? There is a quote in Life Together which says, We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be consistently crossing our paths, canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. We may pass them by, preoccupied with our more important tasks. As a priest who passed by the man who had fallen among thieves, Perhaps he, too, was reading the Bible. It is part of the discipline of humility that we must not spare our hand when it comes to perform a service, and we do not assume that our schedule is our own to manage, but allow it to be arranged by God. We have been saved to serve. The current pandemic, is that not an example? Is not our time now, has not our schedules been rearranged? What about us? Jesus Christ asks us to do something. He, and we often like to come up with all the reasons, no, I'm too old, I'm too young. Or, that's really beneath me, not for me to do. How about this one? Have you ever heard this come across your mind when the Holy Spirit is asking you to move? And then you resoundingly offer pushback and say, I could never do that. How about, uh, honestly, Lord, now's just really not the night time. I'm simply not ready. I need a little bit more training on this. This one, you've got the wrong person. Next pew back, please. Ironically, all these statements, all these times that we have pushed back, when Christ has asked us to move forward in faith, are his oxymorons. Could we ever rightfully call him Lord and Savior and then refuse him and tell him no? At the same time, it doesn't go. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me, Jesus says. Unless you allow, allow him to wash you, you won't be willing to partner with him, to perform the works that he wants you to do. We can't be humble servants of Christ and tell him no in one regard, but yet ask him to wash our feet in the next. See, he wants to wash all of that off. He wants to wash away the pride. He wants to wash away the selfishness. He wants to wash away the self-destruction. He wants to wash away the fear. He wants to wash away the anger and the resentment, the hostility that holds us paralyzed, sometimes in situations, in moments, in seasons. He wants to break the cycles so that we will be willing to wash someone else's, that we will be willing to help the next. It's difficult to stand up on a pedestal when you are trying to wash the feet of somebody else. And who better for Christ to give us such a loving demonstration of this than with his very own disciples? Honestly, if we really think about it, think about if, if Christ had a, let's say, a, a headhunter, a recruiter during this time, and he went to them and said, hey, I, I've got this position open. I'm looking for 12, you know, good men to serve, and I was wondering what you thought. I've picked out these 12, but I'd like some feedback. Imagine what they would have said. Oh, be careful. 
This one over here is prone to panic and will second guess you every step of the way. These two over here, constant competition. They will look to take over your job in no time. This guy over here, he steals money and he does really bad at accounting and bookkeeping. Uh, this one over here, he will lie and he will deny that he's done anything wrong. The vast group of them will absolutely desert you when you need them to work the hardest and at the most difficult of time. Oh, hold on one second. Yep, yep, this guy right here, this 12th one. This one might be a promise. Uh, he has some really good financial and political connections. Uh, he's really good with money, understands, you know, supply and demand very well. You might consider promoting Judas. We think he's a good one in the group. Makes you pause to think that if Christ could perform that amongst his disciples and wash that away, what can he do for each and every one of us? And will we be blessed? Yes. The blessing isn't knowing how much as it is in doing. But one would think, how much blessing could there be in doing menial tasks? unclogging a toilet, washing someone's feet. You might be programmed to think that true blessings only come with big lofty things when we get tons of praise, when we get that pinnacle of a thousand likes on social media. Sometimes we get lost in the great servant leaders like Malcolm Luther King that has gone before us. But use, lose sight of the small things that we, the Holy Spirit asks us to do every day. Pray with the customer service rep who just got on the phone and told you that no, they will not offer you that rebate. To offer help and assistance to somebody who is struggling. To put yourself in a vulnerable position. That is what Christ is calling us to do. To be servant leaders. To be humble. To be humble within our aspect. And there's 13 habits. Before I go, as we come to the conclusion, if you have a piece of paper at home, if, if you have the ability to stop and, and write this down or maybe send yourself an email, I ask you to do that. Write it yourself. Uh, let me give you 13 habits of a humble person. And trust me, as we go over these 13 things, the Holy Spirit will move you on one, two, several of them, asking you to work and to dig deeper in these areas. First, they're situationally aware. They're aware of the situations that they are part of and that they are in of. They are aware of the greater community around them. Number two, they retain relationships. They are looking to make connections, not within their own group, but outside of it as well. And then they maintain them. They continuously strive to work at them. Number three, they make difficult decisions with ease. Why? Because they put others ahead of themselves. And number four, they do just that. They put others ahead of themselves at all times. Walking into a building, no, sir, please go forth. Checkout line, no, you have two items, please go before me. Number five, they listen. They don't hear. Here, they truly listen to what others are saying. Number six, they are curious. They see something that doesn't make sense, that seems out of place, and they ask the questions, why? How come? How does that affect somebody else? Number seven, they speak their mind led by the Holy Spirit. Number eight, they take time to say thank you. Simply saying thank you to those who have given on to them. And number nine, they have an abundance mentality. They do not think in the terms of scarcity mindset, that there is only enough, that there is a limited supply, that I have and I need this. They think abundantly that there is more than enough that we can all share and partake in. Number 10, they start each sentence with you and not I statements. 11, they accept feedback, even if it is negative. 
12, they assume responsibility. In 13, they ask for help. They ask for help. There's someone who needs to hear that, so I'm going to say it again. Holy Spirit says, I need to repeat this one. They ask for help. Matthew 5, 14, 16 reminds us. It says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and place it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Every deed done for the glory of God is a good deed. Every deed, regardless of what it is. We aim high by bending down low. Mother Teresa has this quote of humility, of what it means. Humility is a mother of all virtues, purity, charity, obedience. It is in being humble that our love becomes real, devote. If you are humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know who you are and to whom you belong. If you are blamed, you will not be discouraged. And if you are a saint, you will not put yourself on a stand. I leave you here with these final two things. Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. My brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Everything that we do, every aspect, even our jobs upon which we receive a, a dividend from, our monetary, even that is to find work for Christ. Even that is for us to bring our Christian selves to our very place of employment. For you see, we might live in regards to a certain dividend, but what we do for Christ pays eternal. You can't put a price tag on something with eternal value. The song that we, one of the songs that we started off service with before, here today was, Here I am, Lord, it is I. Show me how to aim high by bending low, to be of service to your people. Let us resoundingly declare, Here I am, Lord, your humble and faithful servant. Let me be the one to go and wash the feet of those that need it. Let me be the one to extend a hand. Let me be the one to show humility and humbleness to others. Christ is calling each and every one of us, especially in this time and space that we are in. Watching and waiting for the Holy Spirit to move us. We ask him to do so as his children, as his students and followers. For our love is real, and it is our love that is made real in each and every action that we take part in every day. Here ends today's message that has been poured out through the scriptures and has been poured and laid out for each and every one of you. We ask you to go forth, to take this message in scripture, to move within your heart, within your home, outside into your community. That here we are, Lord, your humble servant.